uh, therefore e te whānau tīkina tīkina atu rā ngā kākono ngā pihi ngā mahuri pi tiki tia ona taia ona taia ora ona taia o tipu kia tipu tōtika kia tipu whakahihi kia tipu ki te whaiao ki te ao mārama ngā pūtake kia papatua nuku ngā wawata ki a rangi nui tēnei te mauri ka whakataka tēnei te wānanga ka whakakake tēnei te ia ka whakamaua ka whakaputaina ki te whaiao ki te mārama tanga tai a hoa ho Today's event is part of a monthly public sector community of practice that we at the lab host, but we host that in collaboration with our council and government agency colleagues. Um, we have a shared interest in promoting and prioritizing final led design and innovation practice and promote the active involvement of community families, whanau, ainga, and rangatahi in decision making and leadership towards intergenerational well being. Um, this is a really conversational learning space uh, where we meet others who work in similar contexts and we learn from each other. Um, and today's conversation, we have Angie. I'm really excited about this one. Um, Angie is of Ngati Poro ancestry and is a hardcore South Hollander. Um, she is currently Kaitohu Tangata Fenua with the lab. Uh, welcome, Angie. It's been really awesome, really awesome to have you on that team too. And she has a long history of working with the whānau led design space. Uh, she's been supporting here whānau whānui or papakura while leading an innovation process focused on thriving futures for tamariki. Okay. Uh, tuatahi me mihi au, uh, ki a kui e te tuakana, uh, tōna mo te, te karaki o te ata, te mihi mihi ki a tātou. Uh, ki, a, ki a tātou hui hui mai nei, uh, nau mai hore mai i tēnei wahi, um, Hey, Faka Fiti Korido, Hey, Faka Fiti Fakaro, Norada Hemahinu Nui Kiatato, Kohikirangi Timanga Kua Puti Awa Kungati Puroti, Norada Hemahi, Aroha, Kio Koto Manga, Kio Koto, Awa Kio Koto, Marai, Tina, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Kiroma Tate Katoa. Kia ora, everybody, I'm Angie Tangari, I'm Ngati Puro, born and bred in South. Uh, South Auckland and love my uh, my community, raising my two boys here with uh, my husband and Papakura. I'm the Kai Tohu uh, Tangata Whenua of the Co-Design Lab, so I very proudly um, work alongside my um, Kai Tohu Tangata Tariti, Dr Penny Hagen, who's on the line um, this morning. I don't know about you fellas, but we I don't know of many other Tangata Whenua, Tangata Tariti leadership uh, models, and we're really trying to stand that up um, as an example for, for, for council and other agencies. So really proud to be in the role. Um, I think this is like my second or third week, it seems to be going okay so far. Um, and I'm really, really lucky to be able to um, have this opportunity to share with you some of the work that um, CSI um, and uh, the Auckland Co-Design Lab has been supporting here in Papakura, which has been to understand how do we support uh, whānau to lead the systems design and systems innovation for better outcomes? How do they help us shift, shift systems based on um, what's important to whānau and what can work in locality for whānau for wellbeing. And I'm gonna drop into a bit more detail about that um, in, a, in a moment. I'm very excited about that, um, that work. But um, you might be thinking, why are they asking us whether we're near or far to a watermelon on this Wednesday morning? How does this relate to innovation practice? And that's a good question, Eti Fano. Um, and that, the reason why we're asking that is in our in our evolving practice and our learning, what we're uh, recognizing is this uh, really important principle of proximity, and particularly how near or far our Fano who are experiencing the most inequity are from centralized power or decision making, and how might we think about that? Um, whether that's collapsing the distance for whānau um, and uh, between whānau and centralised um, decision making and power, or it's thinking about how we might share the power and control that we have um, as, as an active part of the system. So this thing of near and far is, 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 is emerging as something quite useful um, to help us figure out how we create the spaces where Fano can step in and feel valued, feel safe, and feel like they can lead the process. So what we're going to go into a breakout now, and um, I think Baruch's going to, or, or Lee's going to do some magic, and you're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, 
but what we want you guys to think about, and it's based on uh, near and far and power, is how near or far do you feel to the people who have power and influence in your mahi? And Brooks just dropped that in, into the chat. So if you guys will just go into your, um, your groups and, and have a little chat about how near or far you feel um, to the people who have power and influence in your mahi, and then we're going to come back and have a little bit of a kōrero about that. Okay, te pai? Oh, kia ora Oh, it's really great to see the comments, some of the um, whakaro that's already been shared. I'm going to ask Donna to share my slides so that I can just check it on my notes as we're um, having a kōrero. Um, yeah, everything that you guys have been talking about, right, is... Um, is what we're thinking about too. So our remit, the, the TSI, CSI and Auckland Co-Design Lab remit is how do we support um, radical innovation for compelling alternatives and systems change that will support better outcomes for our whānau, right? So we're in the, we're in the change business, just like all of you. Um, and what we've been thinking about is how we are conscious um, and practice understanding that um, power um, and the nature in which power is exercised has the potential to compound or address inequity. So the way that we're exercising power, the way that it's manifesting in our system has, has the potential to address the inequity that whānau are currently experiencing, particularly significant inequity. And it also has the power, so it has the power to compound it or it has the power to address it. And so we're holding it as a, as a principle of practice and really understanding what does that mean and what is our practice? How do we evolve the practice around it? Similarly, um, for us, distance for pa from power and control can sometimes mean you can get on and do some things and sort of stay under the radar but it also means that it's challenging in terms of the systems change. The distance can become challenging in terms of um, supporting the systems change that you, you often are working towards. So if we go to the next, um, the next uh, slide. So what, am I, what are we talking about when we're talking about power? Can we go to the next one, Donna? Well, it's not this one. I'm not talking about this type of power or this next one, thanks, Donna. Um, I'm talking about this one, the next one, Donna, thanks. We're talking about um, how we think about the centralised power that sit in our, our systems and its distance from whānau who are experiencing the most inequity. Um, and as Craig was saying, um, that distance, just as we often as, as practitioners feel quite distanced, maybe isolated and sometimes powerless, um, in, in, the, in our own system, Fano are telling us they feel the same distance and um, the same isolation and the lack of value um, because they're so distanced from, from, from our centralised decision makers or the mechanisms for centralised um, decision making and power. And so what we've been thinking about is what does it mean to reverse engineer the processes that hold power centrally? And what does it mean to collapse that distance? So if we go to the next slide, on slide six, most of our institutions agree on the shifts that we need to move towards to, to address inequity and to achieve better outcome for our, outcomes for our whānau. What we haven't been able to figure out, but we're figuring out together as a whānau like we are today, is the how. So the shifts are, are pretty much standardised and, and mandated across most of our um, government departments and across a majority of our system, but we're still figuring out what the arrow looks like. So we know the what, but we're not quite sure about the how. And the thing that we've been thinking about and supporting Farno to help us do is the how, and that is we think some of these system shifts can be achieved by far no leading innovation processes that are strength-based, um, values-based, um, that are localised, that are Indigenous-led. So we, we think the way that we can start to think about these shifts and the systems, conditions and capabilities we need to build so that we can achieve these systems shifts 
are, are likely to be led by whānau and whānau leading the design and doing the problem solving and, and testing what works based on what whānau, what matters to whānau and what can work for whānau in, the, in their place, in their space. If we go to the next one, Donna, that would be great. And if you can hit the arrows for me, that would be great. So we started to talk about this thing around reverse engineering and it's based on, um, if you can keep going Donna, there's some arrows that will pop up. Yep, thanks Donna. Um, we started to talk about what does it look like to reverse engineer what the traditional systems um, of provision look like now. And when we think about the sort of traditional policy um, making cycles and the, the places of centralized power and how those traditional cycles um, are, are currently facilitated and then they move out into sort of departments to operationalize and to roll out national programs and then they sort of go into into community and support our whānau um, or not um, in locality. What we're trying to figure out is how we go back the other way. So if you hit the other arrows, Donna, that would be choice. And what we're wanting to support is, um, is the, sp the safe space and the support for whānau to figure out in their place what's going to make a significant difference for whānau right now based on what matters to them and what's around them in terms of the existing ecology of wellbeing or support. So what's the natural, social and cultural infrastructure? Um, that exist and works for whānau and how do we understand those conditions and those capabilities to support wellbeing based on what whānau tell us will work in their place and then what are the capabilities and the conditions that we build back into our systems and back into the centralised places of power that means you're building new systems, conditions and capabilities to create the shifts that we need to have that will help our whānau to achieve their, um, their outcomes and their aspirations, and to build on the strengths of Fano and, and um, community. So what sits at the heart of that though, is how we conceptualize power and how we start to consciously understand how we share power in the system and reverse those processes, but also as how we might share our power um, as, as practitioners, and as human beings in, in place. Um, so that sort of sits at the heart of that. We'll come back to the um, how we might share power as practitioners at, at the end of the corridor. So that's kind of our thinking around, well, there's some sy system shifts we're all trying to work towards and um, how might whānau guide us around the capabilities and the capacities that we need uh, to grow to, towards those system shifts um, and also how do we hold and conceptualize power as a key principle in the way that we work and the way that we collapse the distance between whānau and centralized power. Um, so that's how our sort of systems thinking and how we're holding power in that systems thinking and reverse engineering. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the whānau-led work and then I'll, we'll come back, we'll circle around. So um, on to slide eight, please, um, Donna. So when we talk about whānau-led, well, this is what I call it, I call it whānau-led systems innovation. Um, and we've been supporting um, several projects um, across South Auckland um, and uh, into West Auckland now. Um, what we're talking about is being able to curate a safe space where whānau feel safe and valued to lead out innovation processes in their locality, in their community, that are based on what their strengths are, that are based on what their aspirations are, and that produce compelling alternatives to what we have right now in terms of the status quo. So we're all in the change game. And so what we know is if we keep doing the things that we've been doing, we're not, we're not just holding um, inequity um, at, at where it is right now, it will continue to increase. So it will compound inequity. So if we keep doing what we're doing, um, we're gonna get more and more inequity um, for our whānau. So what we've been thinking about is how might whānau lead out the, the innovation processes that help us to understand what the compelling alternatives are to what we have the status quo right now. So that often means that they are thinking about um, uh, 
alternatives to services, programs, deficit approaches and interventions. They're thinking about how they, how they build their social capital, how they build um, their social networks and more pro-social um, relationships, um, how they connect to whānau to whānau, how they support other whānau in the community, how they scale values like whanaunga tanga, manaki tanga, because these are strengths that they've identified in their own community. So um, some of the, the prototypes that we've um, we've tested here in Papakura and uh, South Auckland um, as well, are alternatives um, to services, interventions and um, deficit-based um, approaches that are based on the strengths of our community, that are based on the aspirations um, of our whānau, and that are based on existing cultural and social infrastructure, and how we enable more of those things that are already working for whānau towards wellbeing. Can you go to the next slide, um, please, Donna? Um, it's easier sometimes to say what it's not. And, um, we're kind of moving away from, we used to talk about whānau-centred co-design, but we're kind of moving away from co-design and talking more about whānau-led systems innovation. Um, and this is why, you'll see why. When I'm talking about whānau-led systems innovation, it's not a design process that whānau have been involved in in some part. It's not a, a design process where we have drawn on research or lived experience or there's whānau voice incorporated in it somewhere. Um, it's not a process, design process or innovation process that's geared towards better outcomes for whānau, but whānau haven't participated. And this is something that I'm really passionate about. What we're often talking about now is whānau voice. Um, so the thing about saying co-design, whānau, co-design and whānau voice is that often that means the minimum for that is that we've talked to some whānau at some point or that we've incorporated some kind of research at some point. But um, my, my hope is that we move away from talking about we need to hear whānau voice to we need to support whānau to lead in the space. And there is a fundamental difference and um, a quite a sophisticated practice that you need to curate the space and have the right people supporting with the right skills to do that. But um, that, that's what we're striving for. We're striving for whānau to be leading end-to-end -end innovation processes where they have the technical expertise, they have the technical innovation expertise and the lived experience. That means they are applying that lived experience in the innovation um, process. And that really helps us grapple with the complexity of the challenges that um, we're, all, we're all trying to address um, at this time. So it's a really, a, um, it's really about us moving away from sort of passive participation um, and processes to how do you support whānau to lead? And there, there's quite a lot of work in that, but I, I think it's the right thing to do where whānau have the technical expertise to apply their lived experience in an innovation process that creates compelling alternatives that will support and by default drive systems change. And that's because when whānau are prototyping and designing, their ideas and their, um, their prototypes are so fundamentally different to a system response because they are based on the things that matter to whānau and their values lead strength-based and um, in our case often indigenous knowledge lead. Could you go to the next one Donna? Can we go to 10? So what we sort of say it is, is supporting and enabling whānau to, in their place to lead our localised, to design and test in their place, localised strength-based um, values-led um, solutions, responses, supports um, that address our most complex challenges. What's so interesting about these processes is that because whānau come into the space um, as a whole whānau, as a whole human being, often when they're designing, they're designing with all that complexity as they're going along, they never compartmentalize it, which is what we tend to do um, for simplicity in, inside of our institutions and our, our systems. We tend to try and um, simplify something down so that we can just solve one problem. 
what whānau can do is they can step into an innovation space with the right conditions and if they're feeling safe. And they can design for solutions and bring all of that complexity with them. So you're not trying to grapple with, oh, we have to think about all those things. They're already bringing it with them as they go. And that was, that's what makes them such amazing um, innovators. And it, it makes their prototypes, their testing and their learning so um, complexity um, resilient. So we're all trying to grapple with these complex problems, but they can lead design processes where, they're, where the learning and the outcomes are complexity resilient because they're bringing it with, with, with us. It is totally what we're talking about is totally about um, locally led, um, centrally enabled, uh, regionally supported, uh, all of that stuff that we're all talking about. This is what we think it looks like in place. Um, what have we got to talk about next? So, can we go to 12, Donna, please? Just two things that, can we go to the next one, Donna? Just two things that we're holding to do that work. So when I talk about whānau led um, systems innovation, um, I know you guys have, have been really lucky to hear Roy Mata talk about this kōrero. Um, but we're using Hotu Waka as um, an incredible indigenous navigation and innovation system that really helps us to understand a way of being, doing, and complexity. So this, this really helps us to navigate, um, you know, the, uh, that arrow. It helps us to uh, navigate the uh, ambiguity, the gray spaces, right? So this thing helps us to really uh, move away from program, uh, programmed or processes around innovation and really helps us to figure out a way of being together in relationship to the work. So how are we how are we on this journey together of innovation, which can be completely challenging and um, discerning, uh, can produce all of this sort of cognitive dissonance um, as we grapple with the complexity. This, this process really helps us to understand the phasing of, um, a, a, of a, a navigation process where we are um, moving through the work together in relationship and in relationship to the mahi and the kaupapa. Um, the second thing that helps us navigate it, can you go to slide 15, please Donna? And this is evolving is um, what we call a tikanga-led innovation practice. So that's a set of values and principles that help us to understand how we might facilitate the work in a way that acknowledges the mana of whānau, that supports rangatiratanga, um, that helps us to build a mutually um, supportive learning environment, that helps us to strengthen our whanaungatanga. Oh, um, can we go to 15, please, um, Donna? Um, can we go to the next one, please, Donna? So I won't go to, into detail, but so we've got a phasing that helps us understand the, the journey of innovation, which is Hotu Waka. And then we've got a set of principles that drive the practice that sits with that process. And these principles, principles help to guide us in our relationship with Fano and our relationship with agencies in the process, but in our relationship with agency. Um, and so the one that I just wanted to talk about um, today particularly was the concept of mana and how that helps us to think about how we share power, power and control in our immediate space with Fano. So if we just go to the next one. So the two provocations that we think about um, in the space when we're working alongside Fano is how are we acknowledging the mana of whānau in this process? And then um, how are we sharing power and control in the space to acknowledge the mana of whānau? Um, so those are two kind of provocations. And we use our tikanga framework to help us navigate that and behave in a way that is mana enhancing, that, um, that creates the opportunities for whanaunga tanga, et cetera. But it really just gives you a really um, conscious and intentional uh, approach um, to how you support uh, uh, whānau feeling valued, whānau feeling closer to the decision making or maybe power and influence, and whānau feeling like they are valued and seen as um, equal 
leaders and equal partners and understanding um, what we can do differently for better final outcomes alongside agencies. So I'll just talk to a couple of examples about what that looks like um, in practice. We go to 17, please, um, Donna. So we think about mana as a concept um, and there's lots of work around how mana is manifest in um, different uh, disciplines. So kaupapa, Māori research methodology and practice has got, there's some giant um, Māori academics that have done a whole lot of work around, well, what does it mean to acknowledge people's mana, for example, in research? This, is, this work is built on that as a foundation. So when we think about mana, it's the inherent power, influence and potential of, of beings. And that that is equal for all beings, no matter what job you have or where you live or um, what qualifications you have or what you earn, that's equal. And that's the way we think about it in these co-creation and innovation spaces with Fano and with agencies. It's to say, we're really supporting mana audite, which means everybody's got the same mana in this space, regardless of where you work, regardless of where you live, everybody has the same mana. So to do that, to make sure we're ensuring all of the mana um, is acknowledged in this space, what we start to do is to think about, well, how are we sharing power and control with whānau who might not feel as close to power and decision-making as we might. So if we go to the next one, um, I'll talk to the types of practices. Oh, you might have to hit it again. Sorry, Donna. Um, so some of the things um, that we think about is why is it important to, to think about um, power and control in this way? It's important because what we've just been talking about, because the way that we exercise power and control can either um, alienate people, isolate people, or it can include people. It can either compound inequity or it can address it. So we're holding it really, really um, consciously in the way that we're working with Fano, but also in the way that we're thinking about the system. So what we, because it's an important way of, of recognizing people's mana in the space, we, we start to have some really particular techniques um, around how we share that in the space. And actually it stops being about sharing it and it starts to become about how you took the fulcrum of power for me. And that means that I have to start stacking the fulcrum because people who ex experience the most inequity in our community, they feel so, so far down on the power fulcrum. You have to have to load it up the other way so that there's a sort of an evening out and they feel like they're equal in, in these spaces. Um, so if you hit the, um, for the next bit of the slide, um, Donna. So here's some of the tactics that we use um, when we're working with Fano, so that they feel that their mana is being um, acknowledged and valued and they feel like they have power in, this, in the co-creation and in the in innovation space as equal partners with agencies. One of the things that we do is we develop a kawa. That's some rules of engagement and that's led and determined by Fano. So they, from the outset, they are determining what the space looks like, how, what needs to be in it for them to be safe, what do they need to participate to their fullest potential in the space. So that looks like um, some principles or a kawa and a tikanga around what will, what will be required in the space um, based on what whānau need and whānau want. The second thing that we do, which uh, doubles up the workload, but it's so worth it, is that when we're in innovation processes, we're doing the work in the, in the phase we're in and we're building the technical expertise of Fano to be leading the next space at the same time. They're not participants with the story, they're gonna be the innovation leaders in the process. So you have to do the work, do the insights, do the prototyping, and you're also at the same time building the capability of the Fano to lead out the next phase as the technical experts, not as participants. So that means you're doubling up in the work phases. This is why you need a team to do this work and it's time intensive. We often don't value that. We don't value our capability um, 
component of the work. It's critical if we're wanting Fano to lead and we want Fano to lead because they're our best bet at figuring out what the what the arrow is, what the system change might need to look like. Um, it's imperative that the, their contribution is reciprocated and that doesn't always mean koha or money, it means you have a conversation with Fano about what would it, what would a meaningful um, reciprocity in this space look like for you? Um, so some of our Fano, it was things like um, they wanted to do some training or they wanted to get a qualification and we helped, we helped to get the resourcing for them to do the training. But some of our fun of it was we designed some My Food Bags and when they did the work, they picked up the food bag and they had, a, they had their dinner sorted for the night and they didn't have to stress about that uh, running around and doing that with the whanau. So really it's, it's, it's understanding um, what it means to, for whanau, what, what is the meaningful reciprocity whanau. On that though, we are in the process of understanding how you move from koha into meaningful uh, remuneration for whānau as collectives. If anybody's got any ideas about that, love to hear from you. Um, um, but the big one, and I've got to round up in a minute, is um, we, we flip the script in our work about who's holding the power and, and who's holding the process. So here in Papakura, our whānau were the innovators, the, the lead innovators, and they were inviting agencies into the process, not the other way around. They weren't being invited into workshops with agencies. Agencies were being invited, if they were lucky, um, to come in and do the innovation with whānau. And that already flips the power dynamic, right? So that's clearly signalling we are recognising whānau as the leaders in this process and whānau as the innovators. So. Um, um that's a really important thing to think about right is um in your practices it's basically what do we usually do and don't do that <laughs> we will usually do a workshop and then say how do we get ten fano here um let's not do that let's build up a group of whānau that have the technical expertise to do it and then invite um um, I can see there's some comments about remuneration, that's awesome. So that's just some thoughts, Fano. And, and that was a lot of talking, sorry about that team, and a lot of stuff. But what we'd like to for you guys to just reflect on after all of that, um, all of that corridor, and we've, we're kind of doing the full loop now, right? At the start, we were kind of talking about where does power sit in the system? How do we reverse engineer that or collapse the distance or how are we thinking about that consciously and then there was just um we've just been talking about um how we might share the power um and the spaces where we're working right now and so what we'd like you guys to do now is just to have a think about um and we're going to have a call you go you're going to go into breakout groups and have a call to doors in what ways might we share the power between the organisations or our communities? I think that um, Brooke's going to drop this into the thing, into the chat. Really, this is about saying, how do you recognise your own power in the space where you are and how do you share that with Fano or how do you share that with communities? I've just given a couple of little examples of how we might do it. Um, so I think Brooke's got, oh, um, so, so, Technical magic's going to happen, and your guys going to go into the um, the rooms. Is that right? Rob? Welcome back, Fano. Um, would love to hear what's come up for you in chat. But just before I go there, just before we uh, moved, uh, there was a question that came up from Meg. So just uh, wonder if Angie could address that. Angie, Angie just said, "What are they? What are Fano innovating? Are they their own solutions to problems that Fano is facing, or changes to the government system?" Hmm. That's a that's an awesome question, Fano, and probably another hour session. But very quickly, um, in like two minutes, um, um, I'll just talk to the work that's happening in Papakura with uh, here Fano, Fano or Papakura, and what um, our Fano here have been doing is they've been thinking about what are the alternative ways of responding and supporting Fano for Tamariki thriving futures. And so that was our big innovation question. What, what, what can we design locally based on strengths and based on our lived um, 
experience um, that could help us to support thriving futures for our tamariki. I'll just give an example about what one of the prototypes are, and then I'll tell you why I say by implication it can drive a systems change. Um, so through the work the they were doing with the agencies, they developed some really good relationships with some of our senior agency le leadership here. And what they said was, now that we know you and understand, you know, all that you bring as a human being, not just the manager of a, of a site or a service, we, we don't need your service, but we do need your experience and your expertise and possibly your connections and some of your social capital to achieve our aspirations. So we don't want to participate in your program, but we do want your support to achieve our aspirations. And so we prototyped, um, it's, it wasn't really a mentoring or a coaching um, program, but they designed a way of being in relationship, Farno and a uh, an, an, an agency leader that they picked. They picked who they wanted to be mentored by. And then we designed a process of Fanangatanga where the agency leader and the Farno connected and worked towards the aspirations that have been identified by Farno. And it didn't matter how big or small the aspirations were. And we didn't say we can't do that because it doesn't fit in our criteria for the program. Well, it's not my job. We just said, what do you want to do? I'm going to help. What we learned from that was that some of our whanau only needed about 15 minutes a week to check in with, that, with their mentor or their coach. And that was enough to put them on the right track and enough support and enough feeling like I'm being supported. Um, for them to progress their goals. So 15 minutes a week toward, truly towards aspirations with someone who's got some really good local social capital and expertise and, and experience um, meant that Fano could progress um, for some of them lifelong aspirations they hadn't been able to before. But also what it helped them do was to connect to their purpose. This is a really powerful formula. If we can support Fano to connect to their purpose, they've got unconditional and pro-social relationships to support them in their purpose, and they've got the local opportunities to action those, um, those aspirations, then they are immediately um, building their own social capital and working towards um, strength-based and aspirational outcomes, is what I would say. So it's giving them the space and the support um, to focus on those things. Uh, for some of them, they've never been given, it's almost a privilege and it shouldn't be. They've never been given the space to stop and think about purpose. What do I really want to do in my life? What do I really want for my family? How do I do it? And the unconditional support. The system implication of it is that the learning is if we front end resource and the aspirational stuff, we might not have to be doing all this crisis stuff. What about if we did 15 minutes a week of that stuff and we didn't have to do a one day, two day crisis intervention because the wheels have fallen off with whānau completely. That, that was one. And then the system um, change implication is, and you know this, the, the, the agency leader said, I'd rather work like this. I'd rather work in a strength-based aspirational way. I don't want to be ticking off criteria and saying no to people all the time. I want to work like this. It's generative. Um, but the, what we're lifting into system out of that whānau work, and we're working with the Social Wellbeing Board, uh, we're also working with DPMC and ACC and other uh, MOH, um, uh, well, Health, Health New Zealand is it now, um, to think about what these learnings on the ground, they can be lifted into systems change. So that, that's what we mean about reverse engineering. So the systems change um, learning out of the work that um, the whānau have, done around the mentoring and the te Taki model, they call it, is we've got a whole lot of human resource that if we fundamentally reorientated and redeployed that towards aspiration in locality, in re relationship, that could have a, like, a, a really significant and positive effect for our whānau in locality. So the learning was what, what makes a difference for whānau is pro-social relationships, aspirational based, right opportunities, social capital, um, local leaders supporting the system learning is we've got heaps of people sitting in our departments that can do that stuff but they are 
confined to what they've been told they need to deliver, it needs to be a service, it needs to be a program, it's not part of your role. So how do we reorientate all of that resource that's sitting um, inside of the system when it's whānau are telling us it would be better for them, but also we know the system people say we, they want to work like that. So that's kind of the um, an example of how we learn from whānau and then we think, as we're learning from whānau, we're thinking about what does this mean for systems change? Hope that makes sense and it's really a surface level explanation of that work, whānau. Oh, kia ora rai e te whānau. I feel like the bearer of doom. I, I don't get the best duty. Um, 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 I'm conscious of our time, so I need to start wrapping this up. But to be honest, I'm conscious while I'm trying to close up. Um, there's some, I'm, I'm feeling really fired up, and I was like, no, but I want more. How can we close this up? But again, he tonga there were time is precious, and I do need to wrap this up. Um, but with wrapping up, um, ite whānau, first and foremost, I want to thank you all for coming to the space convening, connecting and sharing. I heard a comment there like, oh, sorry about the rent. No, the safe space, all the comments, um, so many beautiful, rich all coming out. And I love that we had this, created this space for people to have these types of conversations. There are so many beautiful golden gems and like part of my role of closing up is weaving it all together. But there was so much beautiful richness and sharing. I, I, I'm unable to do it. The best I can do is um, step back to... Um, the comments of Matua Craig because that really resonated. So did a lot of the other kōrero, but feeling valued. What happens if we start from a point of well-being? Again, looking at the system, how much of it has been sanitised down and also being part of something that you didn't create and what that creates. And then also the other thoughts of, hey, but what happens if we started from a marae? What happens if, um, um, and we're all looking at the different funding models, so there's so many comments coming out there and I'm loving that we're shifting to this type of thinking and be able to connect in this space to do that. Um, but most of, all, inform, uh, uh, most of all, I really want to turn my um, mihi out to our kai kōrero of this time um, for opening up this kaupapa for us to have this rich um, kōrero. So tēnā e te tuakana, ui a mai te pātai, um, Ui a mai koe a whakahua ti ake, ko wai te whare nei e, ko wai te teko teko kei runga, ko pai kia, ko pai kia. Um, if uh, some of you have not had the fortune to um, know that amazing anthem from the East Coast, maybe you can connect in with the amazing um, movie Whale Rider. I allude to that because um, I love um, how the story of pai kia, the famous ancestor from the East Coast came out, but in that story, how was the mukopuna and changing it, it was a female um, that rode paikia, which wasn't seen before. Um, please, if I offended everyone, I'm not from the East Coast, I'm trying to hold this space, my apologies if I have. Um, but the most important thing from that mihi there, I want to um, do a mihi out to our tuakana Angie and a reminder what a pleasure it was to have someone from the, um, to show and the lineage, the formidable wahine toa lineage that we had from the East Coast coming in today to share our whenu kaupapa today. And like they say, that famous whakatauki e kore te kumura e kore o mo tōna ake reka. Um, so putting it into um, English terms there, like we have our beautiful sweet kumara, and if you liken it to um, have on the other side as a comparison, the riwai or a potato, and what it's talking about there, or one way to explain it is like with the kumara, it's so sweet. It doesn't need to talk about its own awesomeness and how sweet it is because it's sweet enough. So that's my pleasure here today. I get to do that mihi out to our tuakana Angie for her awesome sharing today. But I also would like to connect into, uh, bring back into the space is from our kōrero last month. We talked about Modi to Modi Mai. Um, from our um, speaker, Dickie, and was talking about the energy and the modi that you feed into the system and what comes out. So it's really great to pick up that kōrero again, continue that discussion with um, Angie, and then again. So while we have that for the framing for this time, um, it's the how. Um, how do we do all the work that we're doing um, there? Um, what I take away too, also from the kōrero, is the mirror into our own practices of everyone sitting here today and what that brought forward of what that mirror looks like when we hold it to our own practices. And also what does the learning look like when you go deep 
as opposed to going across and grasping all these different um, components like whānau led, whānau voice, but actually acknowledging, which I will capture here with the whakatauki, he kai kei akuringa. What do I have within on my own hands and what can I influence within the system today? Um, finishing off my last remark there would be, what I loved is I could see a recognition, that's why I was getting all fired up from everybody where the system needs to change. But what I loved, and even though there was a lot of similarities there, we were kind of hearing like the kawa, tikanga, whānau led, um, and changing the system. What I really loved about Angie brought to the table today, like even though these, all these familiar terms was she brought the magic and a slight difference was the big question of how, how do we do that? But more importantly, um, the clue that she also gave there, because we'll, I could hear from all the comments from everyone while we were doing that, but the key point is how do you lift it back into the system to completely change? So before you leave today and before um, the time runs up, thank you so much, Itefano, for joining us. I know it's not a complete close, but it's uh, until next time that we meet again and we continue this kōrero. Um, other than that, ka tukuna tēnei kōrero katoa ki rungi ngā ararau o tāwhiri, kia rere ka tū kātou. Be safe out there, whānau, until we reconvene again next month. Hei konara.